I, like I said, I've been very lucky with my teachers. I was lucky with them. But you know, I think I've learned as much from other people, or m even more, I think, uh, from my classmates when I was studying. That's very, very important, I feel. You see, we discussed music, we played for each other, and I don't know why. Maybe it's this snob, musical snob in me or whatever. When I, w I, I was 13, I was in college. I was in the conservatory. Yeah, mm -hmm. I would pal around, or even at Peabody, I would pal around with the graduate students or the best violinists in school, the best composition, mm -hmm. composer, the best uh, singers. I just, well, mm -hmm. I had very little time to start with. Mm -hmm. So, you know, because I was practicing and I had all these subjects and homework, I would uh, gravitate towards the best musicians in the school. And, of course, we talk, you know, a lot about music. And I learned a lot from my, I learned so much from my friends and classmates. And that's very important. You went to Peabody mm -hmm. in the United States. Mm -hmm. In my class, of course, there are so many of them who are good. They talk music, you know, they learn from each other. And then, of course, I also learned on my own, you know, from reading, you know. Yeah. I read, mm -hmm. like, the musical analysis, uh, reviews, let's say. Mm -hmm. What are they looking for? Now and then I say, what's the word? I didn't know, you know, uh, let's say the Francis Toby essays. He said, what does he mean by that? You know, and I start mm -hmm. figuring things out for myself. And I would go to a concert and I go hear Michelangelo. And how does he do that? You know, and I watch very closely. And that's part of your education. Mm -hmm. Who was your teacher in, uh, in Peabody? Did you have one? I had several. I had Erno Balog who was a pupil of Bartok's. I had Mieczysław Mutz, who was a Polish pianist, yes. who was the teacher of Emmanuel Lax and Ilana Vered, you know. And then I Wasn't he married to uh, Nela yeah, Rubinstein? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I have a story he about that. Yeah. yeah. He was the first husband of Aniela. You can tell it off then. Yeah, way. that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> He's dead now. Yeah. <laughs> he gets <laughs> soon. <laughs> Although Aniela is still alive. Uh, and... Uh, Leon Fleischer. Uh -huh. Now, um, my story about him is that when I started with him, when I was going to study with him, all, you know, Anshin and, you know, Ruslan Antonovich, you know, all these hotshot pianists. And who were, who were they? Uh, Anshin. Don't ever mention Rubinstein. You know, that's a big no-no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, you know. Then one night, one day, he invites Anshine, Ruslan Antonovich, I guess we were his favorites, or I don't know, and myself, to a concert with the Baltimore Symphony. And who was the soloist? <laughs> Rubinstein. <laughs> and then after the performance, he takes us backstage to meet Rubinstein and his wife, and his. I think he had one of his children there backstage. <laughs> I said a lot of hogwash, not to even mention Rubinstein. <laughs> I mean, I get that. Yeah, they were friends. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when Anshin studied at Rubinstein, had lessons with him. Yeah. Afterwards. Who was Anshin? I don't know that name. She's now a faculty member at Peabody. At Peabody. A wonderful. She toured a lot in Latin America and in Europe, mm -hmm. even Russia. Mm -hmm. Those are all pretty. The, the Balo, I know. I don't know them. Was there any that uh, per particularly uh, it influenced you more than the others? <laughs> Well, you know, I'll tell you, they were all good. My first teacher was my aunt, who was, and she, like I was her practice student, but uh, she was a concert pianist, and her teacher was a great Spanish teacher, Victorina that we got in Manila. Then after, you know, her, I went to Julia Esteban, who also taught at Peabody later on. He edited some books. Yeah, you know, they like the list etudes and, the, you know. Is the conservatory, it's something about Santo Tomas? Sa yeah, Santo it's one Tomas. of the conservatories there. There's several conservatories. So, it's a piano town. Okay. I tell you, when I play there, I practice. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It's yeah. like, if you're a singer, you're going to sing in Naples, you know, yeah. <laughs> or in Parma. <laughs> you better be good. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, you'll get I rotten think, tomatoes. Yeah, I think Dr. Zipper used to say mm -hmm. that was true. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because a fourth of the people in the audience know the whole repertoire you're playing. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. 
<laughs> I mean, you just I yeah. practice nine hours a day or something like that before I play there. Yeah. yeah. And then I went to Balog when I came here, and then to Munz, and then to Fleischer. Yeah. You see, what you have to be, to do is to get from each one of these people. I mean, they can be good for everything. What you study your repertoire. Sometimes you have no choice, but as a rule, uh, in general, you study a repertoire that you feel they're good at. Like Munz was, of course, wonderful in Chopin, Liszt, Rachmaninoff. Balog was very good in uh, the classic Mozart, you know, Bach, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. contemporary. I remember when I came to him, I had all, oh, I played all the Paganini etudes and all this. I must have been horrible in, a, in the sense that, well, I was very young. A lot of too much rubati all over the place, you know what I mean? Kind of wild. Mm -hmm. Not technically, but, you know, musically. Mm -hmm. And, oh boy. I couldn't make a rubato, I couldn't make a retard, I couldn't anywhere I wanted without a reason, a definite reason. With I had power. to defend, yeah, yeah, I had to defend mm -hmm. whatever I did as far as those, mm -hmm. uh, as retards and accelerandi. Mm -hmm. So he was very good for me in that mm -hmm. sense. Now, uh, Muntz, you know, it's the Chopin tradition, you know what I mean? It's, mm -hmm. and then, of course, you know, coming from the Philippines, you know who are the best Chopin players? Are the Slavic pianists and the Latinos. I was going to say Brazilian. Maybe. Well, Argentine too. Yeah. Latinos. And the Philippines is kind of Latino. So they were always good in Chopin. Uh, those are the best Chopin players. But anyway, I learned a lot of Chopin and Liszt, you know, mm -hmm. you know from Muntz and Rachmaninoff. And then from Fleischer, well, then you have the Austro-German school. I, I would say that Fleischer was very eclectic in, that, in, the, uh, in the sense that he was good at a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Well, he's a very intelligent man. He didn't have really formal schooling, mm -hmm. but he's one of the most erudite persons I've ever met. Mm -hmm. And he was with, from Schnabel. Yeah, Schnabel. since he was nine. How do you feel about your teachers now, now that you're a teacher? I mean, do you think about what they taught you, or is it behind you and sort of... History, or I don't know. <laughs> you don't, I, I, yeah, sometimes you you must have become your own. I, I yeah, but I take from every. I feel like Michelangelo was my teacher, and Rubinstein was my teacher, and Lipati was my teacher because I mm -hmm. listened to the records and you know mm -hmm. I mean the ones that I heard in performance, mm -hmm. they are my teachers, all of them. So I just take from everybody whatever I can that mm -hmm. I need. Mm -hmm. And then you're, what you're saying is you're giving to your students whatever they need. Mm -hmm. And it's different with each student. There's no set formula. As in any art, I mean, there's no yeah. formula. Yeah. I mean, you know, Hollywood, is, you know, you have a baseball movie that's very successful or a father movie, you know, dad, you know, with a baby. But it's like, and they, all of a sudden you see a spate of all this, and then they're no good, you know. I mean, it's this it formula... Well, sometimes, but most of the time it doesn't work. But we want a formula. I mean, it's Everybody's temptation. looking for a formula. It's a temptation. You know. It's technique. You know, you're looking for a formula where you a technique that everything works. There's no such thing. Mm -hmm. You have to use different for whatever this passage look needs mm -hmm. and whatever the composer needs. And you play Mozart more maybe like this. that was Schubert or Chopin you would play. Or, you know what I mean? It's a different sound. Mm -hmm. A different, there, it becomes instinctive that you will use a different position or a different stroke. And this is, if, as a, if that's Schubert, you know, it's the same passage, but this is smooth. use more arm in this yeah. and of course you don't do that in another one you just take what you can get yeah. from anything from ev everyone and everyone yeah. and I even take from sport when I see a student is very nervous before a contest I've seen this in the swimmers in the, you know how they with their coaches I make them do breathing exercises slow breathing 
because it slows down their heartbeat. Then they don't start, you know, like a house on fire, and then, then they, they can't maintain a tempo, you know? Mm -hmm. You start with, you're, 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 you're a goner, goner. I mean, uh, this girl, who's, she's playing, she started with that mm -hmm. in the competition. Because, you know, what they don't know doesn't count. She just thinks it's done, you know? She starts, you know, she plays. And then in the winner's concert, she just plays that because they have five or six minutes. Yeah. So I told her, play that. And she doesn't think about it. But then, when she gets older, when she's conscious that, they, but you see, she knows she can do it. Therefore, yeah. she'll do it. You know, I gave a few recitals here and I wasn't nervous. Then mm -hmm. I was about 12, you know, maybe when you change. Mm -hmm. Played on a program, I think the Haydn variation, mm -hmm. and I was nervous. And I, I thought, what's this? I had, I never experienced nervousness. I, my students play constantly. Yeah. If you had played constantly, you would have been nervous, but you would have been able to control to it. it. Yeah. You get so used to controlling like your nerves, or you get used to being nervous. But you see, I make them do these breathing exercises. <gasps> You've seen this, you know, they do this. It's because it slows their heartbeat. Do you do you think there's a phenomenon of super kids? I mean, it almost sounds like between 20 years... And a human is a human. Things came very naturally to me, too. But I just had, I just analyzed a lot. Especially when I started not practicing. Mm -hmm. I haven't practiced, really, for about 13 years. And so it's so hard for me to play well now. I don't have time. I teach about 10 to 12 hours every day, seven days a week. Sundays I teach seven days a week, yeah. Mm -hmm. You take vacation? And... I didn't take vacations. Starting two years ago, I took maybe a 10-day vacation. I don't take spring vacation. Mm -hmm. I didn't take Christmas vacation. I didn't take Thanksgiving vacation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I didn't take summer vacations. I mm -hmm. teach right through June, July, August, September. But you see, I'm, I consider myself one of the luckiest people because I love what I'm doing and I'm making a living out of it. So I can imagine some people who go to the office or what, wherever, a mm -hmm. factory, and they hate what they're doing. They can't wait for the weekend. Mm -hmm. And they need hobbies and they need vacations. Mm -hmm. I don't need hobbies and I don't need vacations. Mm -hmm. Because it's, I, I love what I'm doing. I mean, I love playing and I love teaching. It's energizing. But of course you can't love teaching if all your students are bad. Yeah. <laughs> sure. What happens when they, they leave? And probably it's usually because, let's say, when they leave because it's time to go to college. Or yeah, they usually leave I mean, because of college. When they're 17 or 18. Uh -huh. They all come back and visit with me or have a lesson during spring vacation. or That's why I don't have spring vacation or Christmas vacation. Because they're back from college. You know, they, they just visit the workshops, you know, and uh -huh. hear how the, press, the, the little kids that they remember were so little and now are grown up. And some of, you know, look, it's so funny talking about how things have developed. Like the 16-year-olds, you know, they're playing ballad in F minor, they're playing sharp minor scherzo, they're playing winter wind etude, they're playing la campanella and all this. Then the 13-year-old people starting to play this well, sometimes better, said, Mr. Why are you giving him my piece? I said, it's not your piece, it's Chopin's. <laughs> and he said, if they can do it, they can do it. Yeah. <laughs> they have a right to do it. And then they are, those 13 year olds are certain when a 9 year old or a 10 year old plays those pieces. Oh. I had a 9 year old playing the Ravel Toccata. I mean, why are you giving him my piece? I said, because he can play it. I mean, when they go away and they study with another teacher, mm -hmm. do you, do you uh, help them? Do you suggest another teacher? Or? Oh, yes, very definitely. I make it my the business same, to not know. The same teacher. Yeah, no. I, I make it my business to know who the good teachers are in where, whatever you, uh, town or city. That's part of my job. You see, I there are not too many good teachers. You can count them with one hand almost. I mean, great teachers. There's yes. a lot of certain number of big names or good pianists. But that doesn't necessarily teachers. mean they can teach. They're just lucky or they have mm -hmm. good PR or they, take, they talk a good deal. Mm -hmm. Coach, you know what I mean? Yeah. They're, from here, you know, oh, you must be good. Yeah. But then they can't teach. Uh, do you have any any schools where you any, any I did I, mm, or do they say like I want to go to California and you you know who's good in California? Yeah, or if they let's say they're moving, if other I mean, then I have to find a teacher for them. I make it my business to know who's good everywhere, especially if they're a, a wonderful talent. I mean, it's 
such a waste if they don't go to a good teacher. And if, if that's how happens, they don't go to the place and I, you know, go to a bad teacher, they lose interest or they just, you know, mm -hmm. and it's yeah. gone to the wind. Who do you like? I mean, gone with the wind, huh? Who, who, what teachers at the college level have you sent students to that, that you felt when they came back to you were still growing and? Uh, I hate to make, uh, well, no, you, you, uh, uh, well, Pressler, mm -hmm. Fleischer, Russell Sherman, John Perry, these are good teachers, great teachers, Shebo. Um, most of the, look, the, most of the kids here want to go away, far, as far away as possible, I don't know why, they want to go either to the East Coast or the West Coast or abroad. I have one student who wants to go to, Mo who is going to Moscow. No kidding. Uh -huh. You can do that now. Oh, yeah. No Americans could go. There's several. Jonathan Bass no or Bass. He was in Moscow. I'm kidding. He's a Pressler student. What the hell? I don't know how to pronounce that. Bass or Bass. Yeah. B A S S. You know that yeah. name. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I mean, uh, several people have studied there. When they come back and, and play for you, is it, uh, it is it hard? I mean, do you still teach them or? I mean, it's oh, they ask for my comments. Yeah. Sometimes they get better. Sometimes n but worse. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe they come here and they haven't practiced because, you know, they're Christmas, you know, whatever, you know. But I can tell. Do they ever stay here and go to college somewhere? With very, very seldom. I know what I wanted to ask you, but mm -hmm. uh, also, do you, work, do you do chamber music training with them at all? We have good oh. chamber music in this fantastic. You, the Fish of comp uh, Chamber Music is always won by this school. The, the what? Fish of. Uh -huh. You've heard of that. Yes. You know, that, yeah. Uh, kids, you know, 12, 13, they're playing Ravel Quartet, Shostakovich Quintet, Dvorak, mm -hmm. piano, tri tri piano trios. Uh, my, one of my students is playing, uh -huh. you know, uh -huh. with a trio in this workshop this Saturday. Uh -huh. I don't coach them per person. I mean, I coach maybe once in a while, but very seldom. Mm -hmm. um, we have wonderful coaches here mm -hmm. for chamber music. Mm -hmm. Right here on the faculty. So. Most of the national winners for strings. You know, cello, violin, viola are won by this school, and piano. Uh -huh. National. Like in the last 17 uh, General Motors competition, you know, they picked 12 from the whole nation. Seven from, from this school. Uh -huh. They get a scholarship? Or no, they to get a performance with a major orchestra, plus $5,000, something like that. Uh -huh. They mostly come from this school. This school has made a name for itself. Kosciusko, you know, Kosciusko, they're beating all the Curtis, Brenda, be, the, the finalists were from Juilliard, I think three from Juilliard, two from Curtis, two from Peabody, one from Colorado, one from California, you know, mm -hmm. and she beat all, and she was the youngest. The thing about you that I've noticed is that you admire your students, or you appreciate them in their own right, you don't see them as clones of yourself. That's the, not the impression I get. Well, I'll and tell probably, you. Probably what you do when you say you're a psychiatrist, probably you're figuring I'm out... I'm not a psychiatrist uh, consciously. It's just something. Uh, yeah. But you're figuring out what's strong about them. Yeah. Well, what's you see... Good, you know, uh, and maybe they, not everybody You develop that. that. You develop that. But also the things that you have to develop their weaker points. Actually, even work even more on their weaker points. Like it, somebody's good in list, but terrible in math. Then I give them more Bach. Mm -hmm. But you keep lists. Oh, yes. I mean, they have to do something they're good at. Yeah. Otherwise, they lose interest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, it's when I was in the conservatory, I always admired the teachers whose students played differently from each other. Mm -hmm. when, they st when the students start playing alike, for me, that's suspect. But, but of course, you know, it's I, my, my students will play alike. Maybe they have the same person. But the younger they are, the more alike they are. Yeah. Then they get intermediate. Then they get, a, then they start sounding like they studied with a different teacher. Each one of them. Some people think that's the highest compliment a teacher can be paid, is if if their students sound different. But, but they're, sound they're different wood, people. Wood. They're different personalities. The only common denominator I somebody says is that they're all, uh, you know, self-serving statement. But well, somebody said. All your students have good te have the technical security, you know. Mm -hmm. That all oh, that's the one common denominator, except that they all they except that they all do sound different. And you know, choosing repertoire of concerto. Let's say for a concerto competition, 
When you're in a contest, you better play your best. Part of the teacher's talent is being able to... Then it's part of this psychology of teaching. Pick the right repertoire for each student. Mm -hmm. And you have to know the literature, of course. But, you know, one student is, for example, very elegant and has fast fingers. And you'll give her the last movement at the Mendelssohn Concerto. Mm -hmm. And one, another, let's say, a boy, wonderful octaves, beautiful sound, and this... So I give him this. Lots of, uh, you know, I I think I I always tell myself, you know, every after each contest or the beginning of each school year, oh, I have to teach better. I constantly tell myself that, but I just think that I have uh, my I don't know. I I just just think I'm a better teacher now than I was 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. When you were, or 10 years ago. No, you were here about 15 years ago. Yeah. When you were here. Yeah. I'm a much better teacher now. I mm -hmm. feel so sorry for my students then. Yeah, well, that's fine. <laughs> <nice. laughs> <laughs> oh, you can quote me on that. <laughs> sure. But, I mean, I tried to teach my best <laughs> then. But I'm so much better yeah. now. And my students now are very fortunate, probably. Uh -huh. But my students, maybe 10 years from now, will be more fortunate, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're in your prime. As a, as a teacher, what? Like I don't know. Some people are in their prime early, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> earlier. Yeah. They're just born teachers, and they, you know, they call me up. Please send us this, you know, a good contestant, you know, because we need one. Because there is a conductor who wants, uh, you know, who might offer a, that as a prize performance with his orchestra, you know. It's like the ra the races where they try mm -hmm. and invite the top runners mm -hmm. to compete. Mm -hmm. yeah. But this, uh, some uh, contest directors have told me that they got to uh, audition, you know, preliminaries, you know, people in, uh, in New York or Los Angeles or Texas, you know, or Boston. And there will be good pianists. Let's say they go to Los Angeles, there will be like three or five wonderful players. Mm -hmm. But the rest are terrible or below average or just average. Then they come to Chicago. Let's say they will have like 48 auditions. They have to take 45 of them in the semifinals. He said Chicago is blessed with so much talent, student-wise and teacher-wise. Mm -hmm. And it's true. And especially in the pre-college mm -hmm. area. There are so many good pianists in Chicago. That's why a lot of the contestants... That didn't really used to be true. No. Well, I don't know. I wasn't here. You go to the contests in the, um, let's say, 17, you know, this is from all over the country. Two thirds or half of them were from Illinois. A lot of winners from Illinois. Do you ever send any of the kids to college early? 16, 17? I mean, some of them could get in, probably. They can play rings around the doctoral candidates, some of them. It's really a dilemma. Where do you send them? Well, you have to send them to a really good teacher. Teacher, yeah. It, you know, it's just that it's just getting younger and younger. <laughs> Yeah, it was like the four-minute mile. I mean, nobody thought it would ever Well, the 14, that was in 1949, Roger Bannister. Roger Bannister. English. And now high school kids <laughs> run a 37, a, a three-minute 37 mile. Yeah. It's just <laughs> awful. <Yeah. laughs> it's that I get them young enough so I can mold their musical taste. You know, you there are several very gifted musicians and perform but they never quite make it i'm going to repeat myself because one thing is lacking and usually it's because they don't have very good taste repertoire wise and music making in their music making mm -hmm. if you, you mean, don't mind you mean, my you mean taste like style, style? Yeah, i mean you know what i mean it's, it's overdone or uh, or mm -hmm. their repertoire now of course repertoire you know there's a uh, fads but it's really basically the way they make music. You improve yourself by making music yourself. It's not possible to improve yourself, really, if you're not playing. Maybe not practicing so much, but there are such things as, let's face it, fads. You know, they play Bach differently today than they played when I was in school, mm -hmm. which was the Glenn Gould era. Mm -hmm. They do play differently, the Bach, today. Mm -hmm. Like Andrashev is a wonderful Bach player, yes, yeah. but it's more human. It's it's a little more romantic. Mm -hmm. But you know, Bach was a romantic composer. Yeah, 
But he was. The, he plays for the piano too. Yes, it's not uh, so much imitating. It's not so much you know. Maybe Glenn Gould. But you see, the, of course, you know, sometimes it's good to imitate uh, the sound yeah. of the period instrument. But, you know, he composed for oboe, he composed for mezzo soprano, he composed for strings. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Baroque music is, is like pop music today. It could easily be transposed into an, uh, another instrumentation mm -hmm. without any loss of the intrinsic. Unlike Chopin. Uh, yeah, which is basically, if you hear it in another instrument, it sounds different. Uh, you know what I mean? Or Tchaikovsky, even, or uh, Liszt. But Baroque was like pop music today. You know, like uh, yesterday is written by the Beatles, sounds just as good in a. Yeah. Uh, sang, s uh, sa sung or with an uh, orchest orchestrated or you know whatever yeah. or yeah. with a jazz combo, yeah. it's just as valid. The same with Baroque. He wrote the same melody for in the cantata yeah. or for harpsichord or for a uh, string instrument. So why it's not the same. piano? Why not? That's piano? what I mean. Yeah. So it's easily transposed. Yeah. But uh, of course there are of course performance practices that you have to respect. Of course, so I say that because I'm, I, I just happen to love the piano. I'm in love with the piano. Are you playing Bach? No, I'm playing Mozart. <laughs> it's one of my most favorites. I find the last moment that very hard because you need so much concentration. It's you have to need so much concentration, yeah. and it's so easy to get off. And it's when you can't practice as much as I yeah. can't practice, it's hard. Yeah. <laughs>